but thanks for the opportunity to uh, to discuss this paper. I really enjoyed thinking about it, and uh, it has really quite striking results. Thanks also for the uh, for the honor of, of closing out the conference. Um, I think this is a perfect paper for uh, for wrapping everything up because it, it connects to a lot of the themes that have been raised already. Let me summarize briefly. Um, here are the findings. About a quarter of people claim Social Security early and simultaneously receive pension or annuity income, which is a mistake because there's this alternative available to them. They can uh, conduct this arbitrage transaction where they, instead of taking Social Security now, they defer it until, let's say, age 70 um, or at least by a year. <clears throat> and then they're going to take a lump sum pension payout or refrain from purchasing an annuity and the proceeds from that move are going to tide them over while they've been deferring their, their Social Security benefit. Okay, so the simple intuition, which, which was already stated, is, is that you're going to be buying the very cheap annuity on offer from the Social Security Administration and you're going to be selling the more expensive annuity option, which is either the retail annuity or the, uh, or the DD annuity payout. Okay? So, after all is said and done, the most conservative estimates is, is that people in, in this sort of situation um, can increase their after-tax income um, by about 5% of their primary benefit. Um, and and that's, that's for the uh, couples. The singles have a little bit less of, uh, of an arbitrage opportunity. On top of that, in many situations, except when the contrast is with the uh, retail real annuity, you're, uh, you're all also going to get the inflation protection. I should have added here, you're also going to get the, uh, the nice counterparty of the, uh, of the federal government. Um, and then <clears throat> there's a difference between um, between the, the, the DB benefit and the retail annuity because the retail annuity market has much higher prices, um, the arbitrage opportunity is, is even larger there. So the gain, um, really think of the 5% as kind of a, a, a lower bound here. So using the technical language of our profession, I'm going to uh, call this, uh, this paper a slam dunk because uh, this is really quite compelling, striking evidence that people are, are making a major mistake. The, the, uh, the monetary losses that a good number of people are experiencing are quite large. I don't have too much to say about the paper itself. I have maybe one suggestion for a way of extending the analysis, but what I'm going to primarily spend my time doing is talking about how this relates to some of the previous literature, put it in context, and then talk a little bit about where we might go from here, what sort of uh, follow-on questions we can ask. So. Um, there's a previous literature on arbitrage opportunities uh, in this sort of setting. I'll, uh, I'll briefly relate to that. Then I'll try to talk about this question of why people are making the mistake. Uh, I don't pretend to know the answer. I think it's, it's multiply determined. And then we can talk a little bit about what might be done policy-wise, either from the employer's perspective or from the, uh, the government's perspective. So here's the one thing which I think the authors can do and should do uh, to extend the analysis in the current paper. Here is table three. So we're looking at married men born after 1940. These um, are sort of the, the, the people who are facing this um, roughly, roughly now. Um, and these are the people for whom, if you're simultaneously receiving a payout from a DD pension or a retail annuity and, and, and not deferring Social Security, you have, uh, you have an arbitrage opportunity. So all the way on the right and in the, uh, in the lower part of the uh, right-hand side column, you'll see that it's about 25% of people, roughly, who are, who are in this position. Um, but the thing to note is, this is just a sort of an indicator for presence or absence of the arbitrage opportunity. It doesn't really tell you how much of the arbitrage opportunity is available. And there's a very uh, important constraint on your ability to take, care, uh, take advantage of this, which is the size of your DB annuity income or the size of your retail annuity income. Um, if that is, is limited, actually, that sort of limits your ability to engage in this transaction where you're selling the uh, expensive annuity and buying the cheap one, right? So if, just to kind of fix it in people's minds, if someone has DB annuity income because back in their 20s they worked for five to ten years at a company which had a DB plan, then that person might have uh, DB pension annuity income, but it would be a very small amount and they might be limited in their extent to uh, in their in the extent of their ability to take advantage of the uh, of the arbitrage opportunity so just very simple suggestion I think you have enough information to do at least a rough version of this calculation um, I have a feeling the example that I gave is not the important one and by and large uh, everyone is going to be able to uh, take advantage of the arbitrage opportunity in an important way but it'd be nice to uh, to, to see 
Um, so that's, that's, that's one minor suggestion. But let me, let me step back now and try to put all of this in context. Um, so there have been previous papers documenting that there are important financial mistakes that add up to large amounts of dollars. One paper um, points out an arbitrage opportunity that is available for people who uh, have a 401k plan at work and where the employer offering that 401k plan is providing employer matching dollars. Um, and if you're over age 59 and a half and if your plan allows in-service withdrawals actually failing to contribute up to the match threshold, sort of failing to take full advantage of employer matching dollars is, is leaving money on the table. It's failing to take advantage of an arbitrage opportunity. It's very simple. All you need to do is contribute your own paycheck, part of your own paycheck, in order to earn those employer matching dollars. And then you immediately turn around and withdraw the money, um, and you can spend it however you wish. Um, there's no tax penalty because you're over the age of 59 and a half. And um, if you look at the people who are failing to, uh, to grab that employer match or in the situation where it's arbitrage, you get a loss on the order of $500 per year. And now I'm just guesstimating, but if you think that, well, you know, this is kind of a time confined opportunity, you need to be over age 59 and a half, you need to still be working, so maybe you're able to uh, take advantage of this for five years. Let's say, I think this is an upper bound, the loss here is on the order of 25. Right. Here's another potential arbitrage opportunity. Um, it turns out that um, for a lot of people, <clears throat> they are preparing their mortgage when instead they could be contributing to a 401k. And because mortgage interest is tax deductible, that's actually foregoing an opportunity to kind of borrow at a low rate. And because the returns on uh, 401k assets are not taxed, you're foregoing the opportunity to invest in something which has very high returns. And so these authors calculate that uh, maybe people who are in this situation are losing $400 a year. And this is less sort of confined in time. So maybe, um, and I'm not just sort of guesstimating here, maybe this is a, an opportunity that is available for 10 years. The people who are making this mistake for 10 years. So cumulatively, perhaps they're losing $4,000. And then finally, if you have credit card debt on which you're paying an interest rate of 20%, 25%, maybe even 30%, and you simultaneously hold 401k balances, there's a little bit of an arbitrage opportunity available to you. You can take a loan, in many cases, out of your 401k balances. Um, effectively, you're foregoing the rate of return on the assets that are invested in that, that 401k plan, and then you can use the proceeds of that to pay down your credit card debt. And I'm betting that the 20%, 25%, 30% interest rate that you're paying on your credit card debt is going to exceed the, uh, the asset returns that you would get on your, on your 401k balances. And you haven't lost any sort of tax benefits from, uh, from doing this, really, because uh, you can very quickly kind of repopulate your, your 401k plan as you pay the loan back to yourself. So let's say that, um, as the authors calculate here, the loss is $300 a year. This seems less time bound, so maybe you can uh, do this for, for, for 20 years. Um, again, I, I think I'm being overly generous to, to these three previous papers in terms of calculating how big the loss is. Maybe um, you're losing $6,000 of this. Again, complete, complete max, which pales in comparison to what the authors here are finding. So at the, at the least, you're, you're foregoing $10,000. By, uh, by failing to take advantage of the arbitrage opportunity that the authors here are talking about. Uh, the example from, uh, from the presentation a moment ago is kind of eye-popping that it could be as large as hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't think there are too many people in that exact situation, uh, but we're talking megabucks here and people are, are, are not grabbing what is, what is available to them if they are able to kind of go through this complex calculation and figure out exactly how to think about the combination of their DB or retail annuity and social security. But let's then move to what is going on in people's heads. So why are people failing to take advantage of this arbitrage opportunity? I think it probably starts with the, uh, the simple point that people are not necessarily integrating these two decisions. They're thinking of social security claiming in one bucket and they're thinking of the decision, how much you want to cash out from your DB pension plan in, in a different bucket. There's a lot of evidence, and I think intuition also suggests that uh, people engage in mental accounting instead of viewing all of their financial decisions as part of one large um, life cycle optimization problem. They instead break up that problem into many smaller bits. Um, and within those buckets, they're optimizing, but they lose out on the coordination across all those different decision-making buckets. So they're separating in their mind, I'm guessing, 
the uh, Social Security claiming decision and the decision of whether to take a pension lump sum or, or purchase a, a retail annuity. And then as soon as you've made that step, it's very easy to see, it's, it's uh, I think I mentioned before, overdetermined. The psychology of both of these decisions will push people towards failing to take advantage of the arbitrage opportunity. So let's think about the Social Security claiming decision. To start with, the way Social Security is talked about is that it's the way that you get income in your retirement years. So as soon as you retire, it's very natural that you think, okay, well now it's time to claim Social Security. And indeed in the data, it's very, there's a very close link between when people leave the labor force when they retire and when they claim their Social Security benefits. You know, it's something like a, a two month window that, that people delay that, okay? Those are not necessarily linked, of course. You can claim Social Security well after, or um, well before, although it's not necessarily advised, um, you, you leave the labor force and retire. But it's so closely psychologically linked in people's minds um, that, that those two are, are going hand in hand in the data, and therefore people are retiring at age 65 or 66. Um, they're, they're claiming Social Security early and not deferring it as the authors are asking them to. There's also, of course, the framing of the normal retirement age, the language is saying that, well, most people should be claiming their Social Security around the normal retirement age of 66. And similarly, because the options available to you for when you claim are ranging from 62 to 70, anyone who is at all confused or looking for advice on what to do will think to themselves, well, this was designed by someone who was at least somewhat intelligent. Um, I don't think I'm very different from uh, the, the average person. I'll just go with the middle option. The middle option is probably quite safe in the situation, and they're going to end up claiming around age 66. And then finally, um, actually, the, one of the very first uh, discussions we, we heard at this conference was uh, related to this idea that, that people feel, they have, um, that they have paid into the Social Security system. They want to make sure they get something out of it. Deferring your Social Security benefit feels quite dangerous from that perspective because if you defer until age 70 and you happen to, uh, uh, to die before, then you're never getting anything out of the system that you put so much money into. That loss is going to potentially trigger, trigger loss aversion or in anticipation of it, you're, you're regret averse and therefore um, very reluctant to wait all the way until age 70. So again, multiply determined, I think you could go on in this list. Um, the pension lump sum decision, and that's the one I'll focus on as opposed to the retail annuity purchase decision. But why are people not taking a lump sum cash out from their, from their DV plan? Um, again, I think it has to do, at least in part, with how the DV pension is framed for people. You, your benefits are stated in terms of the amount of annual income or monthly income that you're going to get. People view that and it is, in fact, the default. And so um, status quo bias, all the inertia will push people towards sticking with that as opposed to converting it into, uh, into a lump sum. And moreover, employers, if you talk with people who run DV plans, um, DC plans, they are all very concerned about this issue of lifetime income. So whenever possible in their communications, they're pushing people to annuitize wealth, not to, uh, not to take the cash out from their DV plan. So, the advice that people are getting is, is very much pushing them in, uh, in that direction. And then finally, it's just, of course, important to note that sometimes the lump sum option is not available. Or even when a lump sum option is available, it may feel like you can only cash out the entire uh, benefit to which you're, you're uh, entitled. Partial lump sum cash outs might not be um, possible for, for people in that is really what uh, you would want to do if you're going to try to take advantage of the strategy here because it may be valuable for you, you to leave at least some of your benefit in the, uh, in the pension plan, in the DB annuity, because uh, it's, a, it's a valuable form of, of longevity insurance. Um, so those are, those are my thoughts about the psychology of why people are making this mistake. From a policy perspective then, what should we do? I think there's some pretty clear prescriptions from the, uh, from the employer perspective Offering a partial lump sum cash out as an option in DV plans will at least let people take the first step towards, towards thinking about this. And you may be worried that by allowing cash outs or even partial cash outs from a DV plan, people are going to squander the money. I think some of the evidence that we saw earlier, earlier today from uh, Mike Hurd and, and John Tablehouse teaches us that maybe we shouldn't worry so much about that. Um, but, but just to make sure that uh, people are, are getting it right, I think it would be natural to combine 
the availability of a partial lump sum cash out in a DD plan with some advice or maybe even a little bit of clever product design, uh, harking back to, uh, to Bob's presentation from, from yesterday. So maybe um, we will explicitly, as the employer, link the Social Security claiming decision and the, uh, and the partial cash out decision from the DD plan in people's minds and offer them a product, which is the Social Security leveling project, although hopefully a little bit better, um, uh, a little bit better design than the, the one that, uh, that Bob was, uh, was studying and analyzing. So maybe what we can do is offer them the opportunity to have lower payments from, the, uh, from their DD pension after age 70 when they claim Social Security and higher payments before age 70, such that when you combine the DD payout, and Social Security people are actually receiving a level benefit over time. When you offer them that, they'll see that actually, because of uh, the arbitrage opportunity, the, uh, the level benefit that they're receiving um, is, is actually quite high and higher than what they would be able to receive themselves if they were, if they were not to defer. Now, a little bit more complicated, but quite interesting to think about the government's perspective on this. And it's not at all clear to me that anything should be done. Right now, we often have this intuition, if people are making a financial mistake, we want to correct it so that they're better off. And indeed, if we were to correct the financial mistake that people are making here, they would be, they would be much better off. But it comes at a price, and the price is uh, because we're giving more Social Security resources to the people who are taking advantage of the arbitrage opportunity, there's less available for everyone else. Right? Um, so we're really affecting a transfer here. And maybe the transfer is going to people from a district distributional perspective who are already kind of doing fine, uh, not necessarily the people we worry about the most because it's the people who have a DB pension or the people who are, have the means to buy a retail annuity. Um, so and funnily enough, the government might be, uh, the, the social planner I'll say, might be happy that, that, that people are, are making this mistake. Although of course, uh, one thing that uh, should always be in the back of your mind is it, maybe it would be wise to redesign and uh, re-specify some of the formulas on which Social Security benefits payouts are, are based and, and to kind of um, address this, uh, this, this, this potential issue. Okay, so that's, um, that's all I had to say. Again, um, I can't emphasize enough. This is, uh, this is really quite, quite striking, really quite fascinating. I think it's a, a slam dunk. Um, but um, let me just also use my prerogative as the final speaker here to, to take a moment to, to thank John and Seeper and Sloan for, uh, for funding the, uh, the, the, the past uh, few days, gathering us all together here. I learned a lot myself. I uh, certainly had a lot of fun along the way. I think collectively we, uh, we were able to make some progress on, on some very challenging financial issues. So uh, with that, um, I will end.